Fantasy novels and I have had a pretty good love affair over the years. I think I can safely thank fantasy literature for turning me into a reader full stop. That and comic books. I think even today, a lot of my favourite authors, or people who I could comfortably call my favourite authors, are fantasy authors. People like Joe Abercrombie and Robin Hobb. Those two names come up again and again when I think about my favourite authors. Joe Abercrombie in particular wrote a fantastic YA-ish fantasy series called The Shattered Sea, which is very Viking inspired. And so I was thrilled when I got my hands on a review copy of this. This is The Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynne, and it is also a Norse slash Viking inspired fantasy epic. Brand new for 2021, it is the first in an upcoming series by an author who has already established himself in the UK fantasy publishing scene with a quadrilogy which I haven't actually read yet and I think starts with a book called Malice. It sounds great, I've been tempted to read it for quite a few years now. I haven't yet, but I have read this. I've read The Shadow of the Gods and it's really, really fun. These days, when I turn to fantasy literature, I turn to it for comfort. What I loved so much about The Shadow of the Gods is that it scratched that itch that I was looking for in terms of comfort. Even though it's an original tale, and although I said it's Norse and Viking inspired, it is not set in a Norse world. It is an entirely fantastical world that just happens to share themes, setting, and even written characters in common with Norse mythology and Scandinavian folklore and, and language, etc. Even though it is entirely original, it still delivered a sense of comfort. When I read fantasy novels like this one, it feels like I'm wearing a very comfortable blanket, I'm cradling a cup of my favourite tea, and I feel like I'm being taken care of. It harkens back to my late teens, early twenties, when I was devouring so many fantasy novels and feeling a sense of safety and encouragement and satisfaction. So what's it about? As I said, The Shadow of the Gods is a brand new beginning of a fantasy series by established author John Gwynne. It's set in a world that is cold and desolate. It is set in a place three-ish hundred years after a war between real, genuine gods not mythological gods, real gods that waged a war amongst themselves as the Greek and Norse gods tended to do, and that war actually wiped them all out. In this world, all of the gods each had their own animal identity. The father of all of the gods was a big snake, you had a rat god, a wolf god, and there was also a dragon, and the dragon's a little bit different. But anyway, all these gods are wiped out now, and their corpses are scattered. You, you can actually go see the corpses. Later in the book, you actually visit a town that is built into one of these god corpses, into the skull of the big snake. It's fantastic. So these gods were real, and about 300 years ago they had a big fight, and they all died in this big fight, and now you've got a story that follows three humans, and they are all fighters in some way because it's Viking inspired, so they're all axe-wielding, ship-sailing, Viking-esque people. Our three protagonists are two women and a man, and they're all very different, and they are all surrounded by a pretty dense cast of supporting characters, and occasionally that cast blurs together and you can find it difficult to keep track of who's who because the names... It's, it's a fantasy issue. It's an issue with fantasy novels where all the characters have strange, unique names and it's difficult to remember who's who because the names end up standing similar. Definitely a Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones kind of a problem, but if you're a dedicated fantasy reader, you ride the waves and you go with it, and it ends up being rewarding nonetheless. Our three protagonists are Orca, Varg, and Elvar. Orca and Elvar are two women, and Varg is our man. Orca is my favourite. Of the three, she is a fantastic character. She is where the book begins. She and her husband are teaching their son how to hunt. Orca and her husband are both experienced warriors, hunters, and killers. She especially. She is quite a legend in this world, which you see a little bit more of later on. And they're teaching their son 
how to hunt. And they live, by the way, out in the in the countryside, in the middle of nowhere. It really feels like the God of War reboot, if you've played the new God of War game, the, the Viking-inspired one. It really feels a bit like that, where it begins out in the countryside and these are experienced hunters who are kind of moving on and living a quiet life and they have a kid. Very, very similar. Right at the beginning, Orca and her family see that their nearest neighbours have been invaded, they've been killed, and their child has been kidnapped. And this is kind of the running through line of the entire book for all three storylines that children are being kidnapped. Obviously Orca's immediately terrified. She has a kid, might be kidnapped. Then we move on to Varg. Varg is really interesting. He is a runaway slave. In this world, slaves are known as thralls, and they wear these metal thrall collars. And Varg has escaped, and he is after a witch. Any witch will do. There are a lot of witches, and they're called Seether Witches, I think. And these witches are able to cast a kind of spell that he is after, because he wants to discover what happened to his sister who has now died. And we only see this in fragments, and not until the very end do we get a kind of summary of what he's after, but it is pieced together throughout the book very clearly and, and pretty substantially at the beginning. So Varg had a sister, they were both slaves, she's dead, He's run away, and he's trying to find a witch who can cast a spell to help him figure out something about his sister who has died. He ends up with a group of mercenaries. These are legendary mercenaries who he ends up becoming a member of their ranks. And they have a witch that he's hoping to be able to talk to, to get the thing that he's after, but first he has to prove himself and become part of their merry band of misfits. And then our third character, Elvar, is introduced a little bit later on, I think 50, maybe even 100 pages in, we actually get to see Elvar. Elvar is a member of a Viking crew who are also kind of mercenaries. They are hunting this man who is a wanted criminal. They find him and Elvar kind of takes a back seat. Uh, we get to know her crew, her captain, pretty well uh, all through the eyes of Elvar. She herself is quite a mystery up until about the halfway point of the book. So we've got three different characters, three totally separate stories. But as the book goes on, you start towards the end to see how they interlink and overlap a little bit better. But you've got three separate characters, each with something to gain. What I thought was really interesting about the narrative of this book is that there isn't really a specific villain. There is politics, and I think the big political chain that links everything together is the fact that you've got lots and lots of small communities that are led by... I can't remember what they're called. Duke, Thane, something, you know, one of those, a small community led by a leader person. There is a queen, a person who is calling herself a queen. She is slowly making connections, trying to absorb different areas and townships and communities as a way to kind of build up her, her land and her domain. And people are rebelling and rejecting and other people are giving in, etc, etc. That's kind of our political chain that links everything together. But our characters are what really push the story forward. This is a character-driven, character-focused narrative. It very much feels like a personal drama where you're following three different people with three different narratives, inspirations, motivations, personalities, etc. Kind of like A Song of Ice and Fire, but with far fewer characters to focus on. There are three. But as I said, those three characters do have a supporting cast. For Orca, it is the simplest to keep track of. You've got her husband, her son, and later on, two men that she is attempting to train and who end up following her on her mission. And I really like this. It's small, they each have very well-established personalities, and I became very, very attached to each and every one of them. For Varg, again, pretty good. He joins this band of mercenaries, and I got to like a few of them pretty well, and I liked his banter with a select few of them. Elvar, she is a less established character in her own right, and she has an enormous supporting cast of Viking sailors to keep track of, and I really did struggle a little bit there. You might disagree, and you might have a different favourite and a different experience with these characters, and that's part of the fun of it. There's variety here. If you start to get bored with a character, a chapter shifts pretty quickly. Speaking of, the chapters are pretty short, which I liked. 
they varied from, say, 3 to 20 pages long each. So there is generally a sense of progress always being made. I found by the end that this book seemed to have almost a five-act structure. And Act 4, what I'm going to call Act 4, it, everything slowed down a little bit. It was building up to a conclusion, you can feel the build-up, and the build-up seemed to drag a little bit. But in the last, I'd say, 50, 60 pages, what I would call Act 5, Oh man, the conclusion is electrifying for all three of our protagonists. If you can divide this into a five-act structure, which I feel like you can, Act 4 is a real weak moment that is then saved completely by the events of Act 5. It's also under 500 pages, I think it's 480 pages, which I think is a really nice length for a fantasy epic. And it is an epic. It's epic in scope, it's epic in its journey that it goes on, and it's very, very epic in its setting and lore, which I think is handled and drip-fed very, very well. Despite being such an epic, it's not overly long. I think under 500 pages is really acceptable, decent length for a fantasy book like this. And I found that it lacked exposition at the beginning, which is always a mark in its favour. Fantasy books, science fiction books, they struggle with delivering awkward exposition, especially YA fantasy. Exposition is just thrown at you and it's so tacky and so awkward. And there is none of that in The Shadow of the Gods. Nothing at all. It's all handled really, really nicely. As you go, you, the reader, are sinking deeper and deeper into the narrative, the world, the setting, the lore, the characters' lives and it's very natural and slow. And actually, that's probably my favorite thing about this book. It's slow, and I love that. Act one, the beginning of the book, is a very slow burn. It takes its time to build up our characters and their journeys and their motivations. You don't get much backstory. We'll get there. Take your time, it's okay. I really enjoyed that. It doesn't really worry about getting moving. There's no sense of paranoia from the writer. Oh, maybe I need to speed things up. Maybe the reader is getting bored. There's no sense of self-consciousness about John Gwynn in his writing of this book. At least not that I could feel coming through. I can imagine fantasy authors being a little bit paranoid that their book is too slow, worrying about how it will read when it gets published. I didn't feel that. It felt like John Gwynn very confidently was saying, look, this goes slowly, I'm gonna take my time, just enjoy the ride. And I really did. I really enjoyed the ride for that reason. I found it very compelling in its slowness. And I think going back to what I said at the beginning, the slowness helped with my sense of comfort. I felt comforted by the setting, characters, and story, and I think that that was delivered because it was very slow and chill and relaxed. I do like long fantasy novels, I do enjoy a book that takes me on a journey, and I really don't mind if it needs to move slowly, as long as there is progression. I remember when I read, oh, which, what's it called? The fifth Song of Ice and Fire book. What's it called? Dance with Dragons. Yeah, Dance with Dragons. That book and A Feast for Crows, both of those, nothing really happens in those books. They were too long and they were too slow, and I didn't feel like that was deserved or justified in any way. This, not the case. It's slow, it's methodical, but you are always taking steps. Steps are always being made to progress the story, to advance our characters, except as I said in Act 4 when things just seem to slow a little bit too much, but apart from that, brilliant, really nice pacing, confident pacing, and I really appreciate that. So this is a pretty perfect fantasy novel. Fantasy novels always have issues, and I think it falls into a few of the, the tropey problems. Like I said, with its pacing and its bloating and not being able to keep track of characters because there are too many, or the names are confusing, or they're all too similar, blah blah blah. This is, this is just kind of a fantasy problem. Apart from that, and it really is a minor thing in the grand scheme, I thought this was fantastic, and it was so nice for me to spend a few days getting lost in a big, epic fantasy novel like this. I don't get to do that much anymore. I'm too busy. I have too many books of different types and genres to read, and I thought, no, I'm gonna... I was gifted this by Orbit Books, and I was really grateful, and I thought, I'm gonna take my time. I'm gonna enjoy this. I'm gonna treat this as a kind of a holiday, and I'm gonna read The Shadow of the Gods, and I'm gonna enjoy it. And I really did. So thank you to John Gwynn for writing such a confident, Norse-inspired epic. He's done his research, he's got his setting nailed, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. Characters, especially Orca, I was so attached to her. And by the way, 
well done to him for writing two out of three protagonists that are women with agency and power and strength in a world that is not patriarchal. This is a world where men and women are equal, they're both warriors, there is no sexism to speak of really, but that isn't done in an awkward, look how I managed to do this kind of a way. It's just there, this is just how the world is and how it exists and you take it for that and it's great. Orca is an awesome character and I can't wait to see where her journey goes. Varg is also a very compelling character and I loved what happened to him at the end and where his story is gonna go as well. Really, really fun fantasy epic for 2021. Check out The Shadow of the Gods. It's a really fun time. And join our Patreon and subscribe for books. Cheers.